All right, well, welcome to the latest presentation in the National Telehealth Resource Center's webinar series. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are presented on the third Thursday of each month. Oops, I guess I should go to the first slide. Sorry about that. All right, let's try that again. Um, we are located throughout the country. There are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two um, national telehealth resource centers. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. We have just a few tips before we get started. Um, first, your phone um, and our computer mics are being muted um, during the time of the presentation. Time will be reserved at the end for Q&A. Please fill out the post webinar survey. We definitely appreciate that. This webinar is being recorded as you were just reminded and recordings will be posted to our YouTube channel, which is um, at youtube.com slash C slash NCTRC. So today's webinar is hosted by Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center and presented by um, my colleagues, Michael Kurland from West Health Institute, Lori Archibald Pannoni from University of Virginia, David Fletcher from Geisinger Health System, and Becky Harless from Charleston Area Medical Center. And without further ado, I am going to punt this to Mike Kurland. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Pleasure to be here, you, well, here with you and my esteemed colleagues. I want to thank everyone for bearing through another Zoom webinar. Really, really appreciate it. I told uh, a joke over Zoom once. It wasn't remotely funny. Okay, I just want to see if you guys are paying attention. If I know any of the participants, anyone like um, personally, just drop me a, a WhatsApp mic in the chat. Um, but um, so some of this stuff, maybe you already know, maybe you already know about the shift of demographics that we're heading into. In about seven years, older adults, folks age 65 and older, will be about 20% of the population. If you can believe this, boomers are already starting to turn 75. And if anything, these last two years like really opened up our eyes, like the health system is truly unprepared in many ways for the, for the aging demographic. Um, in really meaningful and sustaining ways when it comes to healthcare delivery. The labor shortage just really intensified the access and care coordination challenges that existed for many years, just really brought them to light. And th like the challenges that our healthcare system already disproportionately impacted older adults, especially given their medical complexity. It's obvious our health, our health systems like need to continue to evolve and, and adapt to the needs of older adults and quite frankly, all the populations. Um, and um, all of us that are on this call are big telehealth advocates are already believers. And many of us already believe like telehealth is inevitable, but it's not really silver bullet, right? It's just one tool that could help uh, in, in particular this population. So all the way back in 2021, I say that because these last couple of years have been really warped for me and it feels like 2021 was like maybe a decade ago. Well, uh, West Health convened uh, subject matter experts from all over the country, like from other hospitals, health systems, member organizations, nonprofits. Uh, a few examples are like Dartmouth, the UCs, uh, University of Virginia, uh, Milken Institute, SCAN, and the list goes on and on and on, all with the goal to advance the use of age-friendly telehealth for older adults. We noticed that there was a lot of great, great material out there that was specific for advancing telehealth, um, but it got very, very sparse when it was like advancing telehealth for older adults. And so what this group decided on was like, maybe we could help help this work by putting together some form of guidelines or best practices. And through like tons of hours of consensus building, you can only imagine with like a lot of really good smart people trying to decide on one thing, 
the collaborative developed a set of key principles and guidelines for delivering care to older adults. And that's kind of like what you're seeing right now in front of you. And these P's and G's are really targeted to clinicians and administrators to help guide tangible changes to workflows and practices. And the folks that we have presenting today, starting off with David from, from Geisinger, are just gonna share some examples of what they're living through and some of the best practices and some of the lessons learned. So if you can, hang in there for the next three presenters and send in your questions and let's get started with David. Thank you very much, Michael, appreciate it. I am uh, David Fletcher from Geisinger. I'm the ADP for uh, telehealth. So I oversee our kind of synchronous episodic telemedicine, and then also some of our monitoring, monitoring programs like EICU and uh, e-sitting and that kind of thing. Um, I've been here uh, just under four years. And uh, before that, I was in telehealth at University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences for about 13 years. So uh, been, been at it for a while. And of course, you know, as he, he mentioned, you know, just a huge sea change in the last couple of years. And it's, it's really given us a lot of insight um, into across a wide, um, you know, swath of our, our demographics. And it's, it's particularly important for us at Geisinger, um, you know, this older population is, is a big emphasis for us because, you know, we're, uh, we have uh, 11 hospitals um, and we're really mostly central and northeast part of Pennsylvania. And so, you know, this area is, is very rural, uh, a lot of uh, agricultural work, uh, there was, you know, a lot of uh, coal mining, um, but, you know, naturally that industry has, has gotten much smaller. Um, and so there's not a lot of folks moving into the area. And so our population is, is aging um, at a faster rate, really, even than the nation at large. Um, so our older patients are, are very important to us and, you know, that, that we understand kind of how we can best serve them. Um, and so you know, I think the this 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 initiative has been very important to us, and and I think you know was very interested in these principles. And the, the first principle that I'm you know going to talk about is kind of that really keeping pers the the patient at the center of how you design the program. And I I think that is so important with telehealth because there's kind of this built-in assumption uh, when I and whenever I go anywhere and talk to people about telehealth inevitably people will say, oh yeah, that's gotta be great for like the millennials, the Gen Zs, the Gen Ys, you know, all that. Uh, but you know, I don't know about the older folks, they're not gonna like it so much, right? You know, and I think there's just an uncertain intuitive sense of logic to that, you know, like the, the, the old saying, you know, that it's not the things you don't know that get you in trouble, it's the things you know for sure that just ain't so, you know, and I think, <laughs> I think this is a great example of that. Um, and I think, you know, so we, we, we've really tried to look at, you know, and really talk to our patients and find out what do you really want? You know, we have some of our built-in assumptions, but is telehealth something that you're not interested in? Um, do you have technical challenges? You know, what, what, are, what are your feelings about using this technology? Um, and, you know, and to some degree, we, we kind of jumped into the deep end of the pool with COVID, you know, when our clinics were closed, nobody, we didn't really have a choice. Um, and so, so we had a little bit of a, a run rate. And, and so we were able to do surveys and ask all of our patients across a wide range of demographics, you know, what did you think of, of using telemedicine? And uh, we found really high satisfaction uh, really across all of our demographic groups. And I, you know, that's not, you know, just us really across the country, you, you see that. And, um, and we looked at, you know, breaking it out by age and our, our older patients also liked it. Now there was a grain of truth. They, they, their satisfaction scores were just a little bit lower than, than our younger patients, but barely, you could barely notice it. And, um, and in fact, what was interesting to me was when we compare our group of 65 to 79 year olds to other 65 and 79 year olds across the country, we had higher satisfaction with telemedicine. And I think the reason for that is because we really made a conscious effort because we know so much of our population is older to, to not have kind of uh, downloading apps and kind of cumbersome uh, enrollment processes in uh, like an EMR portal and things like that. We literally just send a link to the patient either through their text or email. They click on that link, 
and they it gets them into the secure network and right into the the video visit. And I think that has really helped why why we see a little higher satisfaction for our our, our older patients. And you can see even the over over eighty age group uh, had a very high level of satisfaction. Um, so you know I think really trying to debunk a little bit of that initial assumption around patients, uh, the, the older patients. Um, the next slide. Um, and so some of the comments that I you know, like to pull, and these are actual comments from some of our, our patients uh, who, who had a telemedicine visit. And you can see this is a wonderful service, disabled, and so you know, I can't drive very well and feel much safer doing the video visit. And so I think you know, this, this highlights, it's not, in some cases, our older population it's, it's even more important for them than our youngers. You know, it's not, it's not just a matter of convenience in this case, it's a, it's a matter of, of safety. Um, and, you know, you can see, you know, it's, it's super simple to set up, much easier than actually having to try to get in person somewhere. And then the, the last one I would I laugh, especially in the first uh, six months or so of our survey result, it's amazing how many of our responses started with the words, I actually, <laughs> and you can tell there's a little bit of surprise at how much they ended up liking this. You know, I think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, like, what is this, this all about? But we see that a lot. I actually really like this. It is really super easy. Visit was very relaxed, easy to talk to my doctor in a way that maybe I wouldn't um, in the clinic. Um, so, so, you know, we were very happy to see this. Okay, great, satisfaction high. Is there any difference for our older patients? And here's where we saw, we did see a, somewhat of a difference. And it's, this question is specifically asking, okay, this is great, we've been doing telemedicine. Let's say we get beyond COVID, Lord willing, someday. And are you, how do you feel about doing telemedicine going forward? And I expected pretty high results because they love it, right? And, and what we see here is, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so you see like that first group is, you know, medication questions and kind of follow up after a visit and pretty broad consensus. Yeah, that makes sense to telemedicine. Um, the next one is like follow up after a procedure or surgery, something like that. Fairly high, but you can see that that lighter color on the far right is the, the age group 65 and older. And so a bit of a disparity there, a little, a little more hesitation. Um, and then, you know, the next one is, you know, for the, for chronic care, and you see a really big disparity there between the younger population and the older population. Um, and so this puzzled us a little bit. We're like, okay, you loved it, but you're not so sure about doing it going forward. Um, and so, and I don't have this on a slide, but my next, our next question was, okay, what concerns, if any, do you have around telemedicine? And what we found was they, they said, I, I'm concerned that it might not be as thorough a visit as an in-person visit. And so I think, you know, that was very enlightening. And I think, again, shows the importance of really having the patient at the center of what you're doing and, and, and communicating with them, because it really had nothing to do with, I'm scared of technology, I'm older, I can't see my phone, I don't know how to use, you know, all these things that people maybe assume. It really was, I don't know what criteria you're using to determine when to do a telemedicine visit and whether it is clinically appropriate to do so. And so I think there was a little bit of a perception that, hey, this was an emergency measure we just did to get by during COVID. And that, you know, that really, uh, you know, sh shone a light for us that, you know, we've got to really be transparent with our patients about when, what, what method we use to determine which visits we do for telemedicine. So we actually put a nice video together with uh, one of our pulmonologists talking about when he likes to do telemedicine, but equally importantly, when he doesn't like to do telemedicine and that we don't schedule those visits for telemedicine when we don't think they're clinically appropriate. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's been, been a key that we've really, you know, needed to, to understand about our patients and push out. And so, you know, we, we took all this, this feedback and, you know, have really tried to design our programs around that. And, you know, like, so for instance, our older population, you know, sometimes they have uh, other caregivers, they have other folks in their home who help them get to their appointments when they can't drive and, and things like that. So how do we incorporate those, the, the, the whole team uh, into the visit? And so one program we put together was called Geisinger at Home Program. And the basic idea of it is, we, you know, Geisinger also has its own health plan. So this is a key component of this, but so the health plan sponsors this program. 
And we send out either a, a nurse or a community health assistant into the patient's home. They take a tablet with them and peripherals, like a handheld camera, um, stethoscope, otoscope, that they can plug into that tablet. And they dial in the doctor right from the patient's home. And they're able to help navigate the visit. And so, so their care team is there. They can see what's going on, ask questions of the doctor, hear what the doctor is saying directly. The patients feel very comfortable that this is a full visit because they've got a nurse helping to direct it and they've got the tools. It's not just sitting there on their iPhone. Um, and then, um, you know, so you can see that's actually one of our patients. That's a nurse and that's a, a nurse educator there on the screen. And I, we've got a, a short video to kind of just so you get a sense of what the, the program is about. By being watched more carefully, I feel like somebody's there for me. And if I ever need them, all I have to do is pick up the phone. I love communicating with the patients and caring for the patients. Whatever they need, they call us on the phone. Geisinger at Home is really a, a new model that actually pulls off a lot of things that we used to do in healthcare maybe 50 years ago. So what we've really done is identified uh, those individuals who have complex medical conditions, who may have hard time getting out of their home to get in to their doctor, whether it be their primary care or specialist. And we take a team of healthcare clinicians out to the home and really try and help manage their um, medical conditions in the home. Hi. Hey, Sarah, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Long time no see. I know, I know. Oftentimes we see patients where they feel they need to see a doctor, but they're too sick to go to the doctor. So in most cases prior to Geisinger at home, they'd be dialing 911 or they would have their spouse or their children bring them to the emergency room. So we're, we're able to bring that access to them. It's wonderful. I mean, it really is to have to, especially when the weather is so hot. Then it's the winter and it's too cold. We have seen a pretty significant drop in both hospital admissions and um, ED visits as a result of, of the program. We still have work to do. We're continuously enrolling. We've identified, believe it or not, about 10,000 patients who probably need some of the services or at least need to be evaluated for the services. I think that it's a privilege to be able to go into somebody's home. I think that, you know, it, it brings down some barriers on the patient side to let us come into their home. To really see all the different things that may, you know, be driving some of their medical issues. As long as you're okay with that, well, that's okay. Jen that's can help fine. arrange that. Yeah, if, if, it's okay. a week, if it's a weekly draw on yeah, her, I can set it up with them and they can come weekly okay. for you. Okay, Very good. I'll set yeah. that up for you tomorrow. To be able to have a patient ask you for a hug because you were able to keep them out of the hospital, um, as challenging as this work is, um, it kind of drives you to, to get up and do it the next day. There's nobody better that have been taking care of me. What we look for is to try and keep patients in their home with their loved ones um, in the best physical condition that they can, can be in. And so that's the, the mission that we're really about, helping seniors make good decisions about their health. Mrs. Dovin, I'll give you like a video visit hug, if I can do that. Aww. You can imagine me giving you a hug. Um, there, there we'll, we'll do that. And then, uh, but the next time I see you in person, we'll get a real hug. Okay, not good. Make, not to make your husband jealous. Sounds good. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you soon, okay? Okay, thank you. And so, you know, you can you can see how much the, the patients really love that program and just, you know, being able to stay in the comfort of their own home. And and the nice thing is, you know, it, it it's best it's the patients love it. And our program was able to save the health plan two million dollars in its first year of, of operation. It's very resource intensive, but to save all those admissions and ED visits, uh, save the program, you know, uh, enormous amounts of money. And, and, you know, like I said, the patients love it. So it, again, I think it's just so important to really uh, listen to your patients and build your programs around their needs. Um, and then you can really see the benefits downstream from it. Oh, so I'll turn it over to, to Becky then, thanks.
Hi, everybody. I'm Becky Harless, and thank you, David, for that introduction. And, and one of the things that I really like, you know, I, I meet with David probably every other month or so, and I always learn something new from, from being able to have these collisions with him. So that's one of the things I love about these webinars and the different events that we attend um, over the, the course of a year or so. But I'm Becky Harless. I'm the AA at Charleston Area Medical Center for the Ambulatory Division of Telemedicine. Uh, so that's all of Southern West Virginia, not Charleston, South Carolina. That's always a big uh, <laughs> bone of contention. Uh, we're currently a four hospital system. As of September the 1st, we have acquired Mon Health. So we're gonna grow to a, about eight or nine. Um, and have about 10% of our total ambulatory visits on telemedicine at this point. I've been doing, I've been working at Charleston Area Medical Center for about 12 years, moved into telemedicine about five or six years ago when my boss came to me and said, we've got some grants, I need you to take over telemedicine. And I was like, okay, what is it? <laughs> So have progressed on this journey through the years uh, to where we are today. But I'm going to talk to you today about principle two, which is equitable and accessible. And really would like to, to talk to you about how CAMC has applied this principle to real world offerings that we provide in Southern West Virginia. And, and I think just kind of as a precursor, this was a lot of work that went into, I think you heard Mike say that, that a lot of work that went into building these principles and guidelines and what specifically they said. And all along as it was going on, I was thinking, so I think we can meet some of these. And on some of these, we're gonna have, you know, there's a gap that we are, we're gonna have to build an action plan around to get to. So I always like to say and show when I'm able to have a speaking engagement to show here's where we're doing really well and here's where we've got some opportunities. So, you know, thinking through, I'd like to explain what Charleston Air Medical Center does. So we created telemedicine hubs and what really the definition of that hub is, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of two hours away from Charleston. So we're centrally located. Most of our specialists, our ambulatory division is somewhere in the neighborhood of over 200 uh, employed providers, and spe mostly specialists, and over 150 plus APPs. Um, but we provide a catchment area for all of Southern West Virginia. So, you know, Princeton is almost, you know, two and a half, three hours away. Lewisburg's two hours away. We see a lot of patients from these areas. So the telemedicine hub really started as an experiment. And, and thinking through the PHE really allowed us to do this, to move into these areas and kind of get a low cost lease to provide what's really an in-person but telemedicine visit. So we took all of the comforts of a in-person physician visit or provider visit and created that in the hub. So there's a nurse navigator there. You still got your same triage when you know you expect them to get a blood pressure and get your weight, do those kinds of things. All, all of that still happens and goes into the chart, but the provider connects from Charleston to whatever rural location that that patient is in. So some, some thoughts through West Virginia. Um, West Virginia, I know Mike said, I think we're looking at 20% over the nation of um, 60, 60 years old and older. West Virginia is on track for 30% by 2030. And we are somewhere in the neighborhood of number 47 to 50 on broadband access in states across the US. So depending on what poll you look at. So there's some difficulties with patients having technology and access from their home, regardless of their, you know, if they're an older population. And, and we're also, West Virginia is a CON state. So back to this thought of this as a, an experiment. Um, the CON state, what, what we found is it's really hard to move specialists from Charleston to Lewisburg or to Princeton, but there's a loophole and the CON telemedicine doesn't fall within the CON. So we're able to move it, move it through telemedicine. And what I like to think about the telemedicine hub is almost if you think about what the AT&T store is in your community, you know, you may be in line to just get a new phone, but the person in front of you may be, you know, look at how do I work my email? How, how do I, how do I do that? Um, I see Mike asking what a CON is, certificate of need state. So that's, you know, you've got to get a certificate of need to move a service line 
and it has it can be contested from other parties in the state. Um, so the AT&T store for, for telemedicine is you can go there and, and receive some help. So kind of where we're meeting the principle and some of the standards, I like to kind of group those top four together. Um, so thinking through accounts for whether it's physical and cognitive differences, cultural and linguistic differences, literacy, technology literacy and access and technology. And I consider that sort of like the shallow end of the pool, right? So that the patients can come into this and we really kind of remove those barriers for them. If they're able to get the few miles to, to the um, telemedicine hub, then we're able to help them through whatever cognitive help they need, linguistic literacy technology, because we've hardwired all of this. The same equipment that I use for a telestroke is sitting in this telemedicine hub. You can listen to your heart and lung, the physician can listen to your heart and lungs from you know, two and a half hours away. And then thinking through you know, access from the home. So the next, the next um, guideline is access from the home. And I think that's moving more into the deep end is maybe once the patient comes to the telemedicine hub and they're like, you know, thanks for showing me, Sonia. Now I can go back home and, and I think I can try this from home. So the patients have options. And I really like to look at it, you know, we didn't have options to access before. The option was you drove to Charleston. To, to see the provider. We've got multiple options for patients now for access. And uh, I think that's the way that we're going. I, I like that. And then kind of where we're, we're not meeting the standard is um, being able to engage in ongoing education and best practices. And it's not that we don't want to, that is on our roadmap. We just don't have the uh, further provider adoption you know, to get to that point. And, and to be honest, I attended a session at Matrix back in, in the spring that was fantastic. There was a, fish, a physician that stood up there and was talking through how to do an efficient telemedicine exam, something I'd never thought of, you know, for, for kind of belly pain. He said, would you stand up and jump for me? And when that was painful, I was like, that's genius. You know, that's really genius. If we can take those kinds of things, and just we're, we're not there yet. You know, that's on the roadmap. We want to get there. And as we continue to see adoption, we will get there. Next slide. So looking at what some of the challenges and successes, lessons, opportunities are um, for, for a telemedicine hub, you know, we, we did this in a couple of different ways. We started with a, embed, a standalone clinic. And then we've also got embedded clinics. So embedded clinics are in uh, rural health centers or FQHCs. And, and that partnership seems to look work a lot more, to be honest, with the, the standalone hasn't been as successful as that embedded clinic. Um, looking through provider practice patterns. So virtual first versus, you know, I need you to see you in person um, for your first visit. Those kinds of things working through that and complex scheduling workflows. We've created a second schedule we have to coordinate. So the hub has a schedule, then the physician has a schedule, the patient has a schedule. So there's, there's additional coordination there um, to be able to, to work through. Some of the successes are, you know, we, we've turned this into a destination. It's almost a field trip destination. For not too long ago, the, the Department of Health and Human services secretary wanted to go and see what we're doing that's innovative and how we're providing this access and just how great it is. Our CEO goes and the patients just want to, they just want to tell you walk in and they just want to tell their story about how thankful they are to have this opportunity to see the provider and not have to drive, you know, their social determinants of health there just to get to Charleston one way is $8 and 50 cents and two tolls. So, you know, you're looking at $17, you got to eat lunch, those kinds of things. The nurse navigator has been a huge success for us. And that nurse navigator, so when you're looking at hiring this person, you got to find a utility player. If, if you can find the best nurse, but if she's just only wants to be clinical, that's not going to be the right, this is not the right role for that person because they're going to be in marketing. They're going out and talking to other physicians, patients, attending the farmer's market, kind of getting the word out there to say, you can come see us here and see your, your provider. Uh, so that, that's a big thing to think about if you're moving in this direction. Uh, the successes is the embedded clinic. 
So that nurse navigator, although we pay for that FTE, we place them in this embedded clinic, they really become an extension of the staff there. They, had, they had, uh, invite them to their picnics, invite them to their events, and they become that person that's like, hey, can you help me get you know, Mrs. Smith in to see a rheumatologist? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll get you in. So, so that end up, ends up working really well. The partner relationships, when you go through um, thinking there's a lot of hospitals closing and what can we do in your community to keep care there instead of bringing care to Charleston. So that, that's been a, a big help. Um, and then the non-threatening approach to provider practice changes. So that's the partner. So that goes one in one with the partner relationships, thinking through, hey, I don't want to upset my cardiologist in town. Well, don't use them. You know, we provide all of our specialists on the platform. Your, your docs refer in and out of there and use the pieces that they want. If you want to refer to in-person cardiology in town, we recommend it. You know, that's fine. Just refer to us, you know, if they want to use pulmonology or rheumatology, something else. Again, we've hardwired the connectivity. There's no connectivity issues. It's hardwired into video. It's hardwired, hardwired into that quality. We talked about the tolls, you know, interpreter services, those things are all. The downstream revenue, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, the, the mission is here, but with, with no money, there is no mission. So when we went and looked at an audit of these, of these patients, all of them ended up new to our system. All but two were new to our system when we did an audit. And what that included is that was new cardiology care, new pulmonology care for these patients they hadn't had. And when we looked at what's coming to Charleston, it's the appropriate things. It's the nuclear stress test and it's the six casts in like a four month period. It's a TEE, it's a gluteal tendon repair. Those are the things that are coming to Charleston while all the ancillaries and the PTOT labs are all staying in their community. And then, you know, moving into kind of the lessons learned is reviewing referrals. And I think this goes into your adoption, your, your, your provider adoption. Um, I was able to early on kind of go through and be like, why are we saying no? I don't understand. <laughs> And just kind of form that as a question to your providers of why why did we say we couldn't see this patient in the hub? They can't they can't drive. To, is some care not better than no care? And and that helps because it's not the administrator coming and saying you have to do this, you have to see telemedicine. It's the patient who has a specific need that's referred to them for help that can't get there. So it's really kind of transforming practice patterns for us. And then competitive partners. This is a lesson we learned not too long ago, two weeks ago, maybe, you know, I was visiting one of the hubs and they said, you know, this other RHC doesn't want to refer. They want to, but they don't want them walking in the doors here to see us. <laughs> so I said, well, look, we've got a mobile unit. And that's kind of the next slide coming up is coming soon is we're going to have a mobile unit. So in addition to our in-person telemedicine hubs, we're going to be able to do telemedicine um, on this mobile unit and we're setting up partnerships with these, you know, we just didn't think about it. It's one of those things like David said, we just, you know, didn't know what we didn't know on that piece of, they don't want their patients walking into another RT. I understand it. I probably would have thought the same thing. So we're looking for a solution on that. And we think the, the mobile unit is going to be that. And then the next slide. It's really just kind of an example and a, a roadmap of where we started and where we're going with the telemedicine hubs. We have found this to be a really successful model for our patients, um, for definitely the older population. And then, you know, that that is actually, a, I, I know this patient, she gave us a testimonial, but one of the things I, I just think really, you know, kind of to David's um, patient satisfaction is, <clears throat> She says she's got the same attention and quality care that you know she felt like she would have gotten in an in-person visit. And actually, maybe even better, she's done a, a couple little uh, marketing pieces for us, but she's moved all of her care to the hub, even her primary care and her mother, her, her really elderly mother, she's moved her into there as well. So just really excited about what's going on in telemedicine and being able to share with you guys and being part of West Health. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, 
So uh, I am Lori archibald Pannoni. I'm here at the University of Virginia. I'm going to talk about uh, our program and how we, you know, try to uh, incorporate some of the principles, the guidelines that are with principle three of having integrated and coordinated services. Um, I'm a geriatric physician. I've been here at UVA since 2002. I work exclusively with older adults. Um, so often have my baby older adults that are 65 and then their parents coming in with them as well. Um, and so we see uh, multi-generational families and we see just a variety of, of patients, both from our local region, as well as from um, outside our region for primary and consultative care. What I'm gonna talk about specifically though, uh, today is a program that we um, put into place really at the beginning of uh, March 20, um, kind of preparing as much as we could and then responding to the COVID pandemic once that hit uh, in our long-term care facilities and in our nursing homes. Um, and so thinking about the third principle, uh, some of the guidelines associated with that, is really that, you know, that ideally that telehealth will you know, facilitate access to older adults health records for the providers, that there'll be safe and coordinated transitions of care, that care is integrated over the whole care continuum, that crucial stakeholders are connected throughout the process, and that st staff are really truly working at the top of their license to drive efficiency. So those are the guidelines with the principal, and I'll kind of walk through our program and how we attempted to um, you know, work within, uh, you know, strive for, you know, success in some of these areas and then, you know, other areas, we still have opportunities for improvement uh, there. And then what's just been, you know, we haven't quite got there yet and uh, needs, a, needs a lot more to be done. So that's what I'll talk a little bit about today. Next slide, please. So our program that we started back uh, in March of 2020, uh, we referred to as our Jerry Powell program, which was uh, standing for geriatric engagement and resource integration for post-acute and long-term care facilities. So really at its core, the purpose of our program was to try to integrate our community of care as we're looking at this pandemic coming down the road for us. And so we collaborated with our own hospital, our health system, our local health department, our EMS, our laboratory to really try to bring together people who are gonna be critically important to have really open communication so that our patients could have the best care. We had uh, multiple different components of our uh, program. Um, we started with a educational discussion series, a project ECHO series in which we worked with our uh, regional staff in long-term care facilities. And it was really a, a listen first approach nobody had ever done COVID before, you know, what were people prepared for, what were people not prepared for, what kind of resources were needed, um, you know, where was COVID, and so, you know, really building that community was our first piece of this. We then uh, worked with our nursing liaison, who was a person who was both part of this um, virtual discussion series, but also connecting directly with facilities to have those same discussions at a more uh, personal level to say, you know, how is your staffing? You know, what is it that you need? You know, do you have gloves? Do you have, you know, gowns? What can we do to help? Sometimes we could provide those resources. Sometimes we could connect facilities with other uh, agencies that could provide those resources. And sometimes we just were there to help think creatively in terms of, you know, how can we get what we need done? We had telemedicine consultation. I'll talk a little bit about that, that as we go forward a little bit more. We also were doing infection control uh, consultation to help prepare for, uh, for COVID and then working with our medical students for both remote and social connections with our uh, residents who were, you know, isolated really in the facilities, especially in the beginning of COVID. So those were the different components of our program. And if you go to the next slide, you know, thinking, you know, as a clinician, what's the clinical goal as I was sitting there with, with our team at the end of February of 2020, looking into March of 20 and kind of knowing that something was coming, but not quite knowing what it was going to be. Um, our goal overall was how can we have the best outcome for our patients, right? How can we optimize our clinical outcomes for our patients in this unknown world that we were walking into, which was COVID at the time? And so with that goal in mind, we really wanted to focus on how can we get people to where they need to be to get their best care? How can we facilitate transfer to the hospital from long-term care? care facilities to be as smooth as possible? And then how can we facilitate transfer back to the facility? 
So in terms of for patients, once they were you know, uh, requiring going to the hospital or needing to go to the hospital, our team would work to help with the transfer of information. What we learned very early on, um, which is better now, but early in the, in the COVID, um, you know, we're talking, you know, March 17th, um, patients were getting sent over to the hospital from the long-term care facility where there may be an outbreak going on and the paperwork that they were coming with, which was critically important in the transition to care, was getting kind of put to the side as contaminated, right? We didn't know how to deal with that at the time. And then ultimately we'd be able to get through that information, but it wasn't kind of sitting on the stretcher, so to speak, when the next team came in. And so what our team was able to do in working with the facility and working with the hospital was able to say, okay, what electronically can we transfer to you from the facility? Because again, our electronic medical records aren't fully integrated. That's a piece that we really need to you know, continue to work on moving forward. But how can we, you know, help with that transfer of inform information to get, you know, the appropriate medication list there on time to get the goals of care discussion? If there's a, you know, do not resuscitate order, how can we ensure that the, the accepting facility at the hospital has that as well? We also work with our emergency uh, services to help with the transfer of the patient, um, which, you know, at, for those of us who were working clinically at the time, at the beginning of COVID was, was hard. It was hard sometimes to find a facility um, or to find transport that were able to go inside a facility during an outbreak, transfer a patient safely and bring them to the hospital. That wasn't as simple as just, you know, calling 911 and getting them over. And so working to know who was able to do that and help to coordinate that. We were then able to work directly with, with our hospital-based colleagues to let them know of the patients that were on the way, to let them know directly um, through our health system that a, one of our UVA physicians has via telemedicine observed this patient and consulted on this patient in the facility and deemed that it is important for them to be transferred for care, to escalate care. And there was a time when we were able to actually directly admit that person to the floor um, to kind of facilitate um, them getting the care that they need to leave the emergency department reserved for patients who hadn't yet been evaluated in that triage line and to get pa patients to where they needed. That had unseen challenges there specifically with transport that um, there's a system in place already for transferring a patient to the emergency room and then, then for EMS to you know, continue with the, the rest of their um, responsibilities but there was not a procedure in place for transferring patient directly to the floor and then having to wait for a bed, for example. And so that was um, something that we weren't able to do for long, but hopefully as we move forward, we'll think there are ways to do that. Kind of on the other side, when patients were in the hospital and getting ready to go back to the facility, um, ideally this is always the case that the facility is well aware and well prepared to accept the patient back, but especially in those early days of COVID to ensure that a, a facility knew their patient was coming back as soon as, they as soon as they could and that they were staffed appropriately because staffing was such a challenge to make sure that we had a appropriate care for the patients. And so our team in coordination with the hospital team would be able to relay with the facility team, you know, Mrs. So-and-so is, you know, being weaned off the ventilator today. The next day she's on two liters of oxygen. You know, maybe we're thinking about you know, three or four days down the road that maybe she would be transferring back so they could start to get prepared for that. So those are part of the integration um, and coordinated pieces that we were working with transfer. For our patients in long-term care, this is their home. Ideally, if it's medically safe, we want to be able to treat people in place and not have to come to the emergency department or the hospital unnecessarily. And so some of the, the components of our program that we put into place, we're working again directly with our health department, directly with the facility, to help to identify and test people in place. This sounds kind of like a simple thing to do in 2022 to get somebody tested for COVID, but in March of 2020, it was nearly impossible. So um, we were able to coordinate with our lab to directly get the supplies to the facility to test and then bring them back and help with resulting there. We were also able to assess with our, what we call our COVID kit, which was our you know, telemedicine deployed kit that had our, our peripherals to allow for a full examination there to bring that to the facility and then um, you know, ensure that our pulmonary critical care consultant had the appropriate tools that they need to fully assess that patient in the facility and determine you know, if they're safe to be cared for there if they need a transfer of care. 
The other component that we had when we were dealing with an outbreak and we were working with a facility that had multiple patients with uh, COVID infection was virtual daily rounds. And virtual daily rounds, um, I think go into a little bit more on the next slide. Um, the goal of our virtual daily rounds was to really have a systematic approach to how to manage communication, clinical care, and management of these very complex patients. So we uh, strove to develop an efficient, you know, HIPAA compliant communication that involved all our clinical de decision makers. So we would have our nursing staff at the facility, the primary care um, clinicians that were taking care of the patients at the facility, as well as our consultant team. We would um, have this uh, time where in 30 minutes or less, we would work to identify anybody who needed within clinical decline and might need a consult, help to escalate care and help with those bi-directional transfers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about virtual rounds in terms of the details, um, but what we were able to see in the facilities in which we were able to implement this, we had um, less patients being able to be treated in place with goal concordant care, meaning they wanted to stay in the facility if at all possible. And with the assistance of our hospital-based team in telemedicine, we were able to help to support that. So if, next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about the virtual daily rounds. And so the key with the virtual daily rounds was that we were able to have all decision makers there at the same time, at the same call, making those decisions in real time, which really deep increase the efficiency for the facility staff so they didn't have to you know, try to track down all the different um, providers that they were working with. So as I mentioned, we had our primary care providers, our hospital-based team, our facility nursing, all there together uh, virtually. And we had a systematic process that we would go through. So we would you know, first go through any acute issues that the nursing staff might have, anything that happened overnight. We would then have reviewed all of the vital signs for each of the residents, whether they were infected or under investigation, to kind of see if there are any subtle signs of people who were clinically declining. We would work to identify uh, you know, patients that might be appropriate uh, for consultation for telemedicine via our primary um, pulmonary critical care consultation or our palliative and geriatrics care consultation. Um, we would then do inpatient updates to help anticipate discharge and facilitate that need, and then kind of the what else. And we were able to really have the systematic approach where we had all the participants there and we were able to do this in 30 minutes or less, or less because again, facility staff was both um, very, very busy uh, and staffing was, was a concern. So with that, in terms of kind of thinking back about the principles and guidelines, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, we were able to um, you know, work to help to facilitate care at, with coordinated transitions of care. We were able to work together to bring crucial stakeholders together to have that discussion throughout the process. It was kind of in integrated into the care continuum. We worked to have that done, but it wasn't really done in a sustainable way. Um, in large part, uh, because we weren't really having all of our staff work at the top of their license to drive efficiency, it would often be our pulmonary care um, subspecialty cons consultant who would be directly calling you know, the, uh, the nursing staff to coordinate the scheduling of the, of the appointment time. So it was getting done, but perhaps it, it would have, um, there would have been a better way that we could have done that to distribute the duties across the team. And then an area that we would like to focus on um, is to really have better access to the health record for the telehealth providers, because again, having different EMRs made it challenging to talk directly and get, um, uh, transfer of information. We did our best to kind of do those workarounds, but ideally, you know, we can work towards a system where we don't have to do the workarounds and the system just works to help us do the work. So um, that's somewhere that we still have to go. So with that, um, just a brief summary of the summary of the lessons that we learned from this program. We learned a lot about COVID, that's for sure. Um, but we learned that telemedicine is helpful. It can be helpful but not alone, really within this, the construct of the rest of our program is how we found it to be most helpful. We could of course get quick assessments. We had shared decision-making and especially when we had limited availability for who could be on site. One of the major challenges that we had is when we're talking about facility-based nursing staff and staffing concerns is that with our patient population, there had to be somebody there at the telepresenter. So the staff had to be there you know, to help with the visit. Um, and that was a challenge in terms of staffing. Um, but we were able to really you know, focus on working together as a care community, 
to integrate the communication and to you know, institute something like daily rounds to help to facilitate that in an efficient manner. So, um, so with that, that's some of our examples of, um, of the program that we had. I think I'll kick it back to Mike now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori, and thank you to the rest of the panelists. You know, hearing everyone's like lessons learned, best practices, and thinking about like the uh, the principles and guidelines, P's and G's is what I like to call them, um, that, um, you know, and also putting my operational hat on, um, it's really helpful for me to hear kind of like where you're already kind of doing this, like kind of innately and in as you're building uh, your workflows and your systems out. And then also, you know, the honesty and like, okay, like we still need to, hey, thanks for identifying uh, these. We really do need to work on these particular guidelines here. Um, I think as like a, a leader in operations, it would help guide, you know, just how I build my programs and the communication around the programs. And, and to that, um, I just wanted to ask David to kick off and then maybe um, everyone else can just kind of weigh in. You're learning a lot. And David, you, you shared some um, survey data and, and, and Lori and Rebecca, you like, you have some lessons learned. How are you sharing that with um, your providers that might be on the fence, or just kind of like your your team and kind of what, what response are you getting now after you share that the, the this new information? Uh, it's a it's a great question and it's uh, I'd say we've been mediocre at best at it honestly. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's a challenge. It, it's getting that feedback loop to the providers. I think is is absolutely key. And I and I I. The reason I know we're not doing a great job of it is because I still see very wide variation within a single service line. So like some of our primary care providers are doing enormous amounts of telemedicine into the patient's homes. And we know from the survey data that the patients get a lot of value out of that. It's much more convenient for them, that kind of thing. So some of our other providers, same specialty, seeing the same types of patients, are barely doing any. And I think it's because I think we the, in the telehealth side have a, a long way to go to try to really explain to providers, you know, it really they had the same concerns as the patients did that, that we saw in our surveys. In many cases, I think there is a perception like, okay, this is an emergency measure, tide us over till we kind of get through the initial, you know, hurdles with COVID. And then we, we can get back to operation normal, you know, and I think that's, you know, there's still a lot to go. And I'd say the biggest thing that we're really focusing on right now is digging through all this data and really understanding, okay, is it, is it just a, an even swap? Do we, are there advantages to it downstream? We've got some indications that are, there are. And then are there instances where it's actually, you can do it, but you really shouldn't because you're going to have to have them come in for a blood draw anyway, just don't bother. You know, and I think that's, we've got to be really transparent with both our providers and our patients about what the answer to those questions are. Um, and so I'm hoping to have a lot of data to, to be able to publish here in the next uh, few years, you know, working with some of our uh, physicians. So I think from our perspective, we're really good at providing data in certain instances. So in my inbox today, I got an email that's updated from our surveys that are on the back end of our telemedicine visits that say, we've saved this many ER visits. And so over, that's a big number, you know, that, that hit my inbox this morning. And that's a really big number that we need to keep showing because, you know, have you heard the budget's bad? And I don't think it's just bad in West Virginia. I think the budget's bad across the nation in healthcare this year. So that's a number that we've got to make really visible. And it's something like $6 million since 2020 that we've saved in ER, urgent care and PCP visits for just our urgent care piece, right? When you extrapolate that out there. Um, so that's a number that we're really good at sharing and we're really good at going and looking and saying, you know, this is the downstream revenue because there's gotta be, there's money and there's mission. But I think we're in the same place you know, with David, as far as with the, the providers and, and, you know, quite frankly, you know, we called it an experiment in the beginning. That was probably a mistake 
because that gives the assumption of, you know, I'll catch it next time. I'm going to skip, you know, but really, you know, we need that engagement. And I think what helps is we've got marketing out in these locations, driving it straight to the patient saying you can use telemedicine and you can use it here, you know, which is, which is creating a pull from the patients instead of administration, which is helping change practices. You know, we're up to, to a 10% volume. That also is, so the key, the conversations are changing over time to say in strategic planning of this is real and this is here at 10%, you've got to consider that this is not an experiment anymore. This is real and it's going to continue to grow. We, uh, there are a few uh, questions um, in the Q, QA section. Uh, we have a, a few minutes. Um, does anybody on the panel want to um, address any any of the questions. And I, I apologize if we don't get to your question, one of us will will answer those questions um, in, in an email or somehow. We'll figure out how to get in touch with you. <laughs> sure. I, I see there's one uh, there directed uh, specifically to me. So I'll jump in on that. And uh, yeah, so we, we uh, we're hit and miss on it. I'll say at the beginning, uh, in terms of getting our uh, the the patients engaged, making sure that they're gonna you know confirm for their appointment. Um, in the early days, we had nothing. We uh, basically the first person who was gonna talk to that patient was the provider themselves, uh, which was a uh, challenge. You know, because then the provider is doing technical support, they're doing all kinds of things. So we we built some infrastructure around that now. So we we check in. We have uh, some like scheduler type patient, uh, employees who will call the patient ahead of time, particularly, and we'll run a report to see if they've done a telemedicine visit previously. If they haven't, we'll call them and just do a tech check with them and kind of walk them through it um, and, and make sure that they are fully prepared for it. You know, and then we also, of course, we've got a lot on our website about what to expect with a video visit and things like that. And again, we try to keep it really, really simple. And so we actually have a lot of patients who are like, you know what, I don't need it, I'm fine, I, 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 can, I can handle this. So um that's great um and and it's 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 definitely been a, an evolution that we we've, we've had to go through um because yeah our, our providers did not like being a uh, technical support for sure thank you david i'm going to uh, real quick guys in the upper right corner if you're wondering gee where can i get these principles and guidelines and all this other great information for uh old, around older adults and telehealth well have no fear uh, West Health, uh, Middle Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, and UVA are working together in creating a center of excellence for telehealth and aging. All you have to do is text CE4TA um, to the following number, 22828. Yes, stop what you're doing right now and hop on that mailing list. Um, Kathy, I think we have just two minutes for, for wrap up. I don't know if we have any more time for the questions. We'll get to your questions, folks, um, but email or, or one of us will call. Yeah, so we are getting ready to launch a website with all of the principles and guidelines. And so if you do this uh, text thing and get on the mailing list, you'll get notified when uh, the website goes live and as well as any new content when it's added. So I encourage you to do that. And I want to thank you for joining us and the... Um, Webinar series, as you know from the beginning, is monthly, and our next one coming up is on the topic of reimagining reimbursements, planning for sustainability for telehealth practice, hosted by Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, and um, looking forward to that on September 15th. So the registration for that is already up on the National Telehealth, uh, the TelehealthResourceCenters.org website. And last but not least, we would love to um, get your opinion on this particular webinar. So we would love for you to take a few minutes to complete the online survey, which I'm hoping will pop up for you. Um, and we will definitely try to get back to you if you had some questions that were unanswered. So thank you for your time and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Everyone.